of the Simpleton Podcast. Today, Laura and I are talking about recovering Nihilus. Hey, we're Clark. also going to talk. Hey, hey, Laura. <laughs> we're also going to talk about. Uh, we had something happen where there was kind of an application of the church's sex abuse policy that was kind of interesting mm-hmm. because, like, a policy is one thing, and then to see how it's applied and what like weird attitudes Catholics have about it is kind of interesting. Um, and then we want to talk about a kind of a way to look at the world right now, that there's these different evangelization projects within the church. And one that I don't think enough people are recognizing, um, this third one I'm going to call the recovering nihilist. All right. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to talk about sex abuse? Okay. All right. So, all right. Something happened at our parish that was not illegal. Um, It wasn't a credible accusation or anything like that, but it was exactly the type of thing that when you go to all these church trainings, you're supposed to be looking at, Mm -hmm. you're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. There was a situation of grooming. It was just like an older man approaching uh, underage people, trying to get phone numbers, looking for friendship, you know? And it's like, is that illegal? No, that's not illegal. Is that grooming? 100% that's grooming, right? And... I was, I had to tell the parish about it. I had to like, I wasn't actually there, but you know, the St. Paul's missionaries were talking to me and I was like, oh no, we have to talk to, we got to send this up the chain also. So, and two interesting things happened is I talked to the parish and one was that the parish told me that the way they keep people safe in the parish is kind of by monitoring things, by using their spidey sense by watching nope. people, you know, and like kind of like looking for creepy people, you know? And I think they also are really worried that, you know, the church at one level, the church is for creeps too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And at another level, you got to kick creeps out of the church because we have to keep it safe for kids and God yeah. can work with people even outside the church, you know? Yeah. So it's not like you sent them to hell by kicking them outside. Yeah. By, by saying Don't yeah. come back, you know? But that kind of rubbed me the wrong way because, you know, I was coming to report this and I'm thinking Spidey Sense is not, by the way, if you don't know what Spidey Sense is, Spider-Man somehow knows when dangerous things are going to happen. It's Mm -hmm. one of his superpowers. It's a strange superpower. But we talk about a lot at Simple House because we want people, if you're like in the hood or in the woods at a homeless camp and you feel like there's something not right. We're like, to honor tap that. Into that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tap into that and get the heck out of there. Yeah. And yeah. if we, if we get somebody at Simple House who doesn't seem to have any spidey sense, yep. um, we only put them with partners who have spidey yeah. sense, you yeah. know? Um, otherwise we, <laughs> we don't trust it, you know? <laughs> um, but the problem with spidey sense is more people think they have it than do. And it's unteachable. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not a system. Right. Like whatever came out of this church reform that we did all that podcasting on is not, hey, just be on the prowl looking for creeps. That's not what came out of it. You know, there actually needs to be a system. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I think it's like also the the thing that um, it's like with all these trainings and the new kind of reforms in the church, it's like, uh, we've been given this like list of behaviors. Right. And it's like the spidey sense is also a little bit about like analyzing, like, well, did he mean it, you know, in this other way or whatever. And it's like, let's say he didn't have darker intentions than just having a friend, you know, that's actually just inappropriate behavior, no matter what, you know, (laughs) and you can't let it happen at your church. It's not okay to let people, persist in that behavior. Well, yeah, it seems to me like there's like an exaggerated sense of like assuming good intentions sometimes. Yeah. And that needs to go away. You know, like it's like, well, is there even one way that maybe that's not really dark what that guy said? And it's like, yeah, but are we even living in reality if we think that's what happened? You know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, then the other thing that happened when I reported this was, you know, it's a delicate situation. Well, yeah, we all acknowledge yeah. it's a delicate situation, right? And but it's in like, well, let's make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah. And it's like, no. No. <laughs> all on the same page is code for let me handle it. Yeah. Like let me, you know, like um 
let's make sure that you agree that I'm going to take care of this and that we'll all do the same thing on this. And the church, we do not want that in our church. Like, yeah, like I mean, that's like the, the old way. Right. And the new way is exactly. like, we're going to give every adult in this church personal responsibility to act on anything, you know? I think that's what became clear is exactly what you said. Yeah. Like I didn't, that didn't click with me when we were like mm-hmm. doing the church sex abuse podcasting and explaining yeah. the new policies. It didn't yeah. click with me that we're just all our own people. We all have to be protecting the children and no, you're not letting father handle it or yeah. this. I mean, and none of the system that came out of the reform is a system that um, is like a hundred percent foolproof. Right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's, there's nothing where it's like, oh, because we have this new system, we've solved, you know, there will be no future abuse. No, yeah. it's like, no, now we have a system. We're not so dumb to not even have a system, you know, yeah. but like, let's wait and see how effective it is, but it won't be a hundred percent. Yeah. You know, and I can't give up my, like simple house happens a lot that we'll meet kids in desperate situations. And sometimes those situations are bad enough that I've got to report them Mm -hmm. to the state. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think a hundred percent of the time the state has done nothing. I hate to say that, but like, but like by me reporting them to the state, I'm not excusing my responsibility for helping these kids. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think also here by me telling my parish, hey, there was a grooming uh, activity that happened. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to confront that guy. Yeah. Right. You know, I feel like I feel like if I see that guy approach kids, I'm going to tell him. Hey. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. know how far I'd go. I don't know if I'd say, hey, get the hell out of here or yeah. you can't do this or hey, dude, just call him out and yeah. completely embarrass him. I don't know what, but I know what I'm yeah. not going to do is like just assume that someone else is going to handle it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I read an interesting thing about, uh, predators look for kind of weaknesses in, in communities and people or whatever to pick their victims. Right. right? And consciously or subconsciously. Um, but there was a thing I read about how, um, a thing that they, um, (laughs) sort of deliberately do is surround themselves with people who aren't, uh, direct or enough to bring up, you know, problems or are really worried about hurting people's feelings. And you find that a lot in Christian circles, you know, like people are trying to be welcoming and inclusive and, you know, and so, yeah, I don't know. We can't be that. I, I also think that there's this thing where the strong families in our parish are just not are probably not in danger of this guy's tactics, you know, cause we look after our kids. We're near our kids. I mean, like once again, I, I think you and I talked about this a minute ago. You're really yeah. naive if you don't think your kids are in any danger. Yeah. No, of- nobody should think that their kids aren't in any danger. Right. But if you have two eyes, two sets of eyes, two sets of hands in your family versus one, you're already at an advantage. If you have a parent that is able to be at church activities you know, with the kids, you have an advantage over families that don't. Right. Um, and and yeah. that's why predators tend to go towards weaker families or single parents or mm-hmm. people who are just naive. Right. Yeah. But it's like, it's part of the duty of like it, as a community, it's the duty of the parents who kind of get it Yeah. to create an environment so that the naive families aren't victimized. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Um, it's not enough just to steer your own kids clear. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's go on to this idea of evangelization projects we've been talking about. So in Catholic world, I hear about kind of two evangelization projects a lot. Um, I think most people will find these two ideas familiar if Mm -hmm. you're kind of clued in the Catholic world. And um, one is this kind of neo-traditionalist idea, uh, a little bit of what we podcasted on with the traditionalist movement, but it's this idea of like, Let's, let's defend tradition, bring back tradition, let's bring back beauty, and this will be kind of the evangelical edge of the church, mm-hmm. and there's some effort being put into that, um, particularly beauty and worship, right? Um, the other ed- kind of like evangelization project that I feel people work on is what I would call uh, the JP2 generation, and I think, or you and I are 100% in this yeah. to a fault, yeah. like I'm going <laughs> to say there's problems with this project, you know? Yeah. And I think this project uh, 20 years ago seemed like really the way to go. 
Yeah. It was, it's kind of this idea that like, uh, the world needs the church. The church has all this amazing, beautiful thought out, uh, theology, um, not just theology, but just wisdom on life. Mm -hmm. And whenever you see something like the New York times or someone do like a hack job on the church, you kind of assume it was well-meaning, uh, that they just don't understand. And if yeah. only I could they just hadn't sit- seen the beauty of, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like if we could have like a private conversation with the guy who wrote this, we could convince him. Yeah. We would move you know, his like, heart. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like he just yeah. doesn't get the beauty that we're like celebrating yeah. over here. Right. Yeah. We're just misunderstood. Right. Yeah. It never really, we wouldn't really believe that he hated us, mm-hmm. you know, that he was actually just out to get us, you know, and that might've been even somewhat true 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Right. I would even say there was a sense in which we saw the whole modern world and the way it had been going in the nineties and stuff as like a kind of a good thing that needed course correction. And the church was the course correction. It was like the organ in the modern world that kind of kept it healthy. Sure. Um, it, yeah. It no, would, yeah. But not, not like the world being totally antithetical to the gospel, you know? Right. Um, like we would have thought maybe even the whole secular modernist project is a little bit from the Western world, which is yeah. very Catholic. Like it even had its roots, you yeah. know, and, and it might overstep at times and the church needs to help it, yeah. you know, kind of keep building, you know, which that might be like, uh, problematic with, uh, like biblically <laughs> a problematic right. view. Yeah. Right. I, I it's, it sounds very naive now that we're putting it out like this. At right. the time, I didn't understand it that way. <laughs> yeah. And now, like, if you're 22, your whole, like, understanding of the modernist project is, like, Trump, Biden. Like, you've yeah. never, like, seen, like, anything that looked like, <laughs> like good a- management. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. Or, or, like, a well-ordered plan. Mm-hmm. Um, you're seeing a lot of things self-destruct. Mm-hmm. Um, including our institutions. Yeah. And also if you're 22, unlike us, you're not like necessarily coming from like a generation of most of your friend's parents were like churchgoers and believers or in organized religion of some kind, you know? Yeah. And what's also interesting with this is like, I feel like these other two projects I just said are kind of coming from people in the church. Like they're coming from our work or Mm -hmm. Neotrad work or whatever, but Mm -hmm. It seems like Jesus is doing a lot of work somewhere else. And I'm meeting people who are converting, who are like finding a real relationship conversion, you know, not just converting to a set of ideas. Um, and I'm calling, I, I, like, I would call them really broadly the recovering nihilists. Mm-hmm. Like, they kind of saw the bankruptcy of what's going on. And somehow Jesus threw them a lifesaver. They grabbed on, uh, and they, they're so happy they got that. And they're talking with a different language. They have a different attitude about things. And I think they're very interesting. And I actually yeah. think that's where Jesus seems to be doing some great work right now. And probably as evangelists, we should go, go to where Jesus is and cooperate with him as opposed to come up with our own whole separate vision of how we're going to like, yeah. I I think an interesting thing, though, about, you know, nihilists is that they're people that are kind of like willing to look at the dark corners, you know, and most people like don't want to look at the dark corners. And it's it's a little scary, too, (laughs) you know, let's define that, because I've noticed that a lot of people aren't comfortable with the word nihilism, meaning like they're just not sure what it means. And there is something nebulous about it a little bit on purpose, because it Mm -hmm. means like believing in nothing Um, or or that. Yeah, right. Everything is meaningless. I guess it's the same thing, right. but yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's something with like the way we raise kids now. It's like we say, you need to go find your own truth, you know? And when you tell a child that, you've been in, inadvertently told them, I have no truth worthy enough to give you. Right. Right. And so now the kid's like, well, you didn't find it. So now what the heck am I going to do? Right. Yeah. And then when the kid pushes, we sometimes say, well, go find the job you love, which is yeah. so weird because there's only so many professional surfers we can have in this <laughs> right. world. Right. <laughs> but like, so these kids are like the kids who kind of like saw what would it mean to believe in nothing? Do I become a hedonist? What do I do? 
and then they see the how just how dark that gets yeah. you know and instead of you know becoming the school shooter who wants to burn everything down or the rioter or whatever they 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 go on this kind of like quest and they like find and somehow christ mm-hmm. is reaching out to them and they find yeah. christ and it's beautiful yeah. and what seems important to me about this was i went to a conference at benedictine college which is a great college here in kansas and i um i got to present some ideas which we need to cover at some point about supernatural social work but that's not what i'm here about i went to a comp i went to some talks on the nuns so the nuns are the people who have no religious affiliation, and they're kind of like a big statistical category oh, in polling. N O N E. Yes, yeah. not the sisters. Or N O N. Yeah, yeah. N O N E. That's right. Or or N O N non whatever. Anyway, not N U N. Okay. Yes, Sorry. not not N U N. All right. So the talk had two. There were two talks, and one talk was from sociologists, and it was very sociologically based. The idea was, hey. If you raise your kid with enough Catholic practices, we can statistically show the probability that they have faith when they grow up is much higher, right? And it was like practices would be like saying a rosary, going to confession, going that to mass. That the father is like active. That's like a big one, right? I think that's a that, big one. That's not a Catholic practice, but that I'm sure that would oh. be helpful. But yeah. they were just kind of saying, hey, give your kids enough. If you kind of got to this magic number of five, the probability <laughs> oh, oh, that your oh. kid was going to be Catholic when they grew up went way up. Okay. Oh, wow. So, and all of this is kind of dumb. Like if it's just like, Oh, build a habit, then he'll be habitually Catholic. Well, that's yeah. not worthless, but yeah. it's also not like relationship with God, you yeah. know, or loving God. It's not like what Jesus came was to habitually make us Catholic, you know? Yeah. And then the next talk was kind of like, Well, the reason why we lost all these nuns was we didn't tell them that um, if they miss mass on Sunday, they're going to go to hell (laughs) because that's a mortal sin. And I always hate it when anyone says what a mortal sin is. It's always a sin with grave matter. You're not qualified to tell me what a mortal sin is. But uh, but he was just kind of like, if we just actually told them the importance of heaven and hell, the importance of these things, they would stay Catholic because like we just we kind of missed the boat on in sense indoctrinating them, you know? Yeah. And so both of these talks are kind of along the idea of, and I don't think any, either of these ideas are totally bad. Like I'm not against teaching a bunch of doctrine to your kids or giving your kids practices. Right. But they're kind of this idea like, Hey, we have this captive audience called our children (laughs) while they're captive. If you force them to do enough stuff or you indoctrinate them enough, uh, they will be Catholic. Yeah. Um, and there's something like inherently off-putting to me about the approach because it's an approach of retention. Yeah. And it's also an approach that is not like centered on letting the child have this like unbelievable everlasting life encounter with God. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I thought I would prefer to go talk to these recovering nihilists who I'm meeting. Like we're having them come to our book club. I'm, I'm finding podcasts by them. I would rather talk to them, find out what the tool set was they had that helped them see through the problem and see and, and help them get to Jesus, you know, and give that to my kids so that when they walk out the door and they see the darkness, they'll have the tool set, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, the problem with these people is they're very steeped in irony. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not really a problem. It's a tool they use, I think. Yeah. But like they almost, how would I, you know, I think the, the, the kick me sign of our age is when you say, I don't agree with everything they say, but, and then you say the, you know, something you find yeah. interesting. It's like, of course you don't agree with yeah. everything they say. Why would yeah. I ever assume you did? But yeah. our our society is very much conditioned to say, I don't agree with everything they say. But And I also think that they're purposefully being offensive sometimes. Yeah. I don't know if offensive is the right word, but... Provocative, um, maybe. Yeah, they're being provocative and they're yeah. kind of trying to sort through who they're actually trying to get to talk to, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, you, you see it in their podcast. Like sometimes the one that turned me on was this guy did this podcast, which it seemed like some club kids from New York city Mm -hmm. and very trendy, very what? And the first, you know, 
twenty five percent of the podcast was it was pretty offensive, and I was very tempted to turn it off. And then I couldn't believe it how they went from that talk to having the most authentic talk about spirituality, mm. and that I saw real evangelization happening. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and it was just really amazing how it turned on a dime. Yeah. And maybe this is just the SpongeBob generation grown up, you know. Uh, <laughs> we raised them this Brilliant way. Cartoon. And- yeah. <laughs> um, you know what's interesting though is uh, with the like I don't agree with everything or you know saying like I feel like blah 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 is the case. You know, um, it's like a way of uh, it's it's like a risk free way of making a point or saying like some people might make this point, but I'm not going to affirm it myself, you know, which I, I, I don't know. I'm not connecting the dots exactly in my head, but, but is that another way of saying this is all meaningless, you know, which is the nihilist problem? <laughs> well, I think it's also this idea that like the most interesting thinkers have bad thoughts. Yeah. Also, you know yeah. what I mean? And it's like, so by saying you like one of their thoughts, have you going to get canceled essentially yeah, by being yeah, associated and, yeah. with their bad thoughts, you mm-hmm. know? And it reminds me of the like nineties when everyone used to say, it's only my opinion, but I kind of think, and then they'd tell you whatever they were going to say. And it's like, uh, of course it's only your opinion. You're the one yeah. talking and you, yeah. of course I hope you think it cause you said it, you know? <laughs> And this is, this was, it's like a way of trying not to, it's like all this preface material in order not to offend, but it was particularly stupid when you saw professors do it. It's yeah. like, I'm paying you for your opinion as an it's expert like, to teach yeah. me. And you're giving all this, this waste of time prefacing, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. But I think when future generations look back on us and they hear all these people say, I don't agree with everything this person <laughs> says, but... Yeah. It's going to be the same type of dumbness, mm-hmm. you know? All right. I don't know how to transition to this. I feel like it has something to do with the recovering nihilists. Um, but there's kind of a vibe right now. You don't hear it spoken out loud, but everyone's kind of getting the same idea that there's some kind of big transition happening. And yeah. it's in the world order. It's in higher education. It's in, you know, the finances. It's It's all over, right? And I don't know that anyone really knows what's going to come out of that. It's like a big reboot or something, or or we're watching something self-destruct and we don't know what's going to come out the other end. And I think where we want to be as Catholics and is it's, it's like we're all on the Titanic and Titanic is sinking. Right. And you don't want to be the person who's got the job of plugging holes, you know, and you yeah. don't want to be the person who's got the job of just complaining about the holes. Like, oh, this next hole. Now now we're really going down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's not profitable. And you don't want to be the person who's like lamenting what a beautiful ship it is and how we're going to lose all this beautiful furniture on this ship. Yeah. You want to be the person building the ship we're going to get on and yeah. building a quality ship, right? Yep. And so somehow as Catholics, during this like time, this like upcoming this like uncertainty that I think we all sense that this like big change is coming. We need to be in build mode, not in conserve mode and not in defend mode. Right. And I think it's wrong when we think that the Catholic, when we think of the Catholic church as the great defender of tradition, yeah. it is, it's a tr- defender of sacred tradition It's a defender of the scriptures. It's a defender yeah. of those teachings, but all those teachings when thought about rightly are incredibly dangerous dynamite yeah teachings yeah it's not the defender of the traditional american way of life right it's not the tra- defender of anything like that yeah. right brings to mind uh to me jesus like healing a paralytic on the sabbath right like he was disrupting <laughs> he was disrupting and he was like doing something new and better right yeah right and i i think where i'm going with this is that i i feel like there's a lot of people who have faith who are kind of talking in terms of like, isn't it so sad? Or um, if only we could save this one thing. And it's like, I mean, savings kind of out of the window, this thing, like things are changing big time and very little will look the same on the other side. And it's time for you to start building what you want to be next. Yeah. You know, not saving, but building. Right. 
I uh, have a neighbor who is a businessman and teaches at a business school and uh, thoroughly Catholic. And his like sort of approach is like you can lament all these things that have been lost. Like you can lament the loss of the mom and pop shop on the corner or whatever. Um, but there's just like always a new opportunity. What's the new opportunity in this market? You know, like every market. And I, <laughs> it doesn't sound like such a profound thought, but <laughs> I, it really hit me when I heard him say that because th that's, that's like, you can kind of like live that way. Right. And what, what a better way. Um, so it's like, as a Catholic, what's, what's like the new, where you're going to live out your faith, what's the new opportunity for evangelization and what's like your vision for the future for your family. Right. It can't be the past, you know? Right. And yeah. I don't, I don't think there's any, yes. And I think, the other issue that we have is we're also focused on things like national and international politics mm -hmm. that have very little that we can do about. Sure. Right. Yeah. And there is like no not in like, our sphere of influence. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and there's going to be no new wave of politicians coming at the midterm mm -hmm. elections. They're going to fix things. Yeah. There could be a new wave of politicians, but they're not going to fix things, you know, yeah. but you do build your family, build your neighborhood, build your parish, yeah. build your local community. And if you focus there, I think something really positive can come out, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And I think we're seeing people who sense what I'm trying to say, and then they go get chickens. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and it's weird because it's like they want something more based in reality. They want to take some ownership. They want to learn a skill. But yeah. it's like, I don't know. I mean, like, go have a kid, you know, or like, there's so much more we could be doing than having chickens. Yeah. You know? I'm for having the chickens, by the way. But yeah, but it's that's a very small, <laughs> like, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm for having chickens, but not chickens as the answer, you know? Yeah, no, chickens aren't the answer. Mm -hmm. so, Self-reliance and chickens are not the answer. Yeah. All yeah. Right. I do think there's something interesting, though, like, um, uh, we worry about these times, like, being so bad, you know? And did you say this earlier? Um, you know, like, uh, St. Augustine was writing during the fall of Rome, you know? And it's like... St. Augustine, like the time of the fall of Rome produced St. Augustine, you know? <laughs> um, right. And um, so what does that mean for us here, you know? Right. And the project of St. Augustine was not to save Rome. Right. You know, right. I mean, like, let's, let's take what's good from it and build a new inspired mm -hmm. city of God, you know? Mm -hmm. um, all right. Those are kind of the things I guess Laura and I have been talking about. And I think... I would love to have more podcasts with people who seem to be working on these projects. Yeah. You know. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, let's wrap it up here and please like, subscribe, share, give us feedback and um, look for the next episode. Yeah. Great. All right. Good to see you, Clark. Peace. God bless, Laura. Bye.